Nobody told you to sit down. Oh, you did? Okay. All right. That's okay. Well, it's so good to see you. You'll probably notice that there's a little bit thin over here in this side of the auditorium. We have a lot of our youth and a lot of our parents at uh, Saints Grove up near Stillwater uh, Family Retreat. And uh, we're so glad that they're doing that, but we'll be glad to see them back with us next week. Why sometimes the news gets so bad you don't want to turn on your television or your radio or open your apps on your devices. What else could happen? It's, sometimes it's pretty bad. But, you know, as I was thinking about the week's news and thinking about the Beatitudes, they swirled in my brain and my heart with even more resonance. And I'm wondering, what would Jesus say? at a time like this. And I think he might look around to see who's following him and just tell us to sit down. I need to tell you some things. And I think we might hear echoes of the Beatitudes. I think he might have something to say about those who are poor in spirit and people who mourn, like the people in Tulsa, and we mourn with them, and the people in Charlotte for they will be comforted. And I think he might ask us to be meek and be merciful. We all know how good it feels to be shown mercy. Might ask us to be pure in heart. He might ask us to hunger and thirst after righteousness and true justice. And surely he would ask us to be peacemakers. We are God's hands and his voice on earth. He has no other until he comes again. Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, blessed are you and your blessings upon us. Dear God, give us clean hands. 
Give us pure hearts. Give us pure minds. Cleanse your church, O God, and help us to be peace and mercy and righteousness in your world. And may your spirit be with us as we worship and praise together. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you guys could stand up, that'd be awesome. I'm thankful that it says, blessed, 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 blessed. And we are. We are so blessed. Regardless of the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between, we are blessed. And I believe that. And that's another thing that this particular song talks about. It's like, I believe that you are God the Father. I believe that you are Christ the Son. I believe that this is the Holy Spirit and they are three in one. So if you believe that, really believe that, I ask that you would just put those things before God. God, I believe that you will take care of my family. I believe that you will take care of my finances because we are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. And we praise you, God. Our Father everlasting, the all creator. Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ. 
Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection. Thank you. Um, this morning, as we've been doing uh, throughout this whole sermon series, we want to spend just a moment um, doing something we've been calling dwelling in the Word, um, where we, we read through the Beatitudes together and we just sit with the text for a moment. And we just let the text sit above us. And so this morning, as we, I'm going to read this once, and then we'll take a moment to ourselves to meditate in silence and to think about this word and to listen for the voice of God, to listen for a word that he might have for you this morning. So let's, let's meditate on God's word together. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of the Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. John's going to lead us to the table now. I uh, was invited to give this week's communion homily. I have an engineering degree. My vocabulary is not that big. But I didn't want to cause a foo or even a kerfuffle, so I just thought I'd give a little talk. So you see this? What is this? Well... It's a stiff neck. <laughs> In the Bible, that means someone who's self-willed, self-centered, rebellious towards God, sinful. In my life, that's something I've known a thing or two about. You see, I grew up going to church with my parents, but when I got older and started to college, I really saw no point, so I stopped. I tried living life on my own terms, and let me tell you, I was a complete failure, and my failure made me angry, angry at this God thing who I thought probably didn't even exist, but if he did exist, I knew he cared absolutely nothing about me. You see, I saw my failures not as my own, but as failures of this God thing who likely didn't even exist. My younger view of God was as someone whose job it was to give me what I wanted to make me happy. And when that didn't happen, well, what was the point of believing in God? This continued on years after graduating college. I was lost and completely alone in the world, and I didn't even know it. I tell you this because you need to know 
that I know what a stiff neck is. I know what rebellious is. I know what self-willed is. I know what alone is. I know what failure is. But also know this. I now also know what God's mercy is, what God's ever-loving kindness is. I know what a free gift of grace is because when I wasn't even looking for God and wanted nothing to do with God, God was looking for me and found me. His grace was greater than my stiff neck. His patience and goodness and discipline were overwhelmingly stronger than I was. Now, do I still have a stiff neck? Truth is, sometimes I'm not perfect. Jesus didn't save me because I'm perfect. He saved me because I'm not. But looking back, I remember how far God has brought me, and so I have confidence in the future. I know God's promises are true. I know he will complete the good work he started in me. Which brings me to why we're here now at this table of remembrance. We're here to remember and give thanks for what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. We read in the Bible that Jesus saves believers. He died for the sins of the world. But there's more to it than that. You see, it's personal. It's extremely personal. Jesus didn't just save the world. He saved me. John, it's personal. Jesus didn't save me because I went to church and was basically a good person. No, Jesus saved me when I wasn't even looking for him. And it's all due to his grace and his mercy and his goodness. And all the credit and all the glory belongs to him. And I'll tell you something else. Jesus saved you, Holly. And Jesus saved you. Amy, and Jesus saved, fill in your own name, come on, let's do it right now, Jesus saved, so that's why we're here, to remember, to remember Jesus gave himself for John, for Mike, for all of us, so, so come now and remember. temptation Oh 
Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Sing really quiet. God, I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side to be led by your staff and rod and to be called the Lamb of God. Oh, Lamb of God. stand together. see you 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. My eyes, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open my eyes, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open, my open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Not just the men sing holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Keep singing, man. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Now at the ladies here, one, two. Ready. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Sing holy, 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 holy. To see you. All right. We are going to pray for a minute or two here. So let's all bow together. There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done, is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? I will rise up. Bye. 
face to face when all is done. This that is voice I am hearing, come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? So it's kind of weird to go from that to this. But this week's sermon is about trusting God. So we're going to learn a song called We Trust in the Name of the Lord. You may have heard it before, but I'm going to sing a line, and everyone is going to sing together. We, we trust, trust in the name, name of the Lord our God. And I might say um, some trust in the wealth of things, and you guys are all going to sing. We, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the chariot. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the horses. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the work they do. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. By His grace all work is through. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in the wealth of things. We trust in Sing the name of the Lord our God. A name worth more than anything. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. His love never fails. His name will always prevail. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. Awesome. Be seated, please. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How is everybody? How are you? Good. 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 It's so good to be here with you this morning. Um, if you're a guest, I want to just say thank you so much for being with us today. You could be a lot of different places, but uh, you've chosen to be here with us, and we're, we're truly, truly grateful to have you with us. So thank you for coming and worshiping and checking this out. Um, my name is Brett Vanderzee. For those of you who don't know, I'm the, the music and one of the preaching ministers here at the Springs. I get to preach alongside Ben Langford. And actually, if it feels a little bit um, emptier this morning, that's because we've got a whole gaggle of folks off at the family retreat this morning and yesterday, so I'm sure they're having a wonderful time of fellowship out there. Um, but we didn't want to 
go ahead with our Beatitudes sermon series and leave, you know, half the church behind. So um, this morning we're going just a slightly different direction with things in the sermon. However, we're still kind of in the same family. You could say that, that this morning's sermon is a first cousin once removed of our sermon series. It's still in the same family, still in the Sermon on the Mount, but we are actually the next chapter over. We're not in Matthew 5, we are in Matthew chapter 6 this morning, and particularly we begin in verse 25 where Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. When I was in fifth grade, I had a huge crush on this girl named Brooke Tiefenthaler, who was a fourth grader. And she, she had just transferred to my elementary school. She was cute. She could sing. Kind of sounds familiar. Um, and I was enamored with Brooke. However, I made one crucial error. I told Ashley about my crush on Brooke. Ashley was a girl in, in fifth grade with me, and she sat behind me, and I don't know why I told her. I guess I was just so infatuated. I want to shout it from the rooftops, but I told Ashley, and she immediately began torturing me with this idea that she was going to tell Brooke about the crush, and I was so scared. I, I began to worry constantly about this possibility that she was going to spill the beans and ruin all my chances. And eventually she even started attaching a date to this impending thing. She said, I'm going to do it on the last day of school. I'm going to tell Brooke about your crush. So I remember, you know, literally in my bed the night before the last day of fifth grade, like staring up at the ceiling, worrying about this dreaded day. And I get to school the next day, and we had these kind of directories that we were signing, you know, kind of like a yearbook. And I remember getting my directory back from Brooke, and in her entry, she had written just one sentence that I still remember. It said, Brooke, dot, 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 I'll never tell. And a wave, a tidal wave of relief just, just splashed over me and alleviated all of my anxiety, all of my dread, just in an instant. And I tell that story this morning as a lighthearted example of what is often for us a heavy-hearted reality. Because all of us, to some extent, at some time or other, have dealt with sheer, unadulterated worry. All of us, to, to varying degrees, have dealt with this human experience of anxiety. And if you're like me, you can, you can find just about anything to worry about. You can worry about the act of worrying in itself. But Jesus has some important words for us this morning in our worry. Let me, let me read, read this entire text that we're, we're looking at this morning. Let's Let's hook in here to Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And, and why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive after all these things, and indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. 
Today's trouble is enough for today. Before we really dig into this whole text here, um, we've got to follow this kind of old cliche Bible reading rule that when you see a therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. So, you know, we see this therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. So what's preceding that therefore? Why is it in this passage. So if we back up just a bit, you'll see that in this section, Jesus is talking actually a lot about possessions. He kicks off chapter 6, we're still in the Sermon on the Mount, and he, he kicks it off by saying that you should do your charitable giving in secret. And then he teaches the disciples to pray, and he teaches them a prayer with forgiveness of debts, a prayer asking for daily bread. And then Jesus, after encouraging them to fast in private, moves on to this passage that we talked about actually about a month ago, about where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And so finally, we get to Matthew 6, verse 24, right before this morning's text, and Jesus says this, No one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. So remember, the Sermon on the Mount is the constitution for the kingdom of God. It's a charter for this new community that is being managed around Jesus. And so in any kingdom, we all know that you can only have one king. You can't be subjected to two rulers. And so Jesus is saying, subject yourself to God's reign, God's rule, not wealth. Because God is a much more benevolent ruler than wealth. God is a much better king than your money. I mean, have you looked at a graph of the stock market recently? I mean, you might as well be reading an EKG reading of somebody who is in cardiac arrest because that's basically what it looks like and that's also basically what it feels like to put your hopes and your daily joys in money because it will enslave you to worry. Money is a fickle friend and, and in 2016 we don't have to think very, very far back to remember what a fickle friend money can be. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually puts it this way. He says, when we seek for security in possessions, we are trying to drive out care with care, and the net result is the precise opposite of our anticipations. The fetters which bind us to our possessions prove to be cares themselves. So Jesus frames this whole discussion of worry, this whole discussion of anxiety, under this idea of serving God rather than wealth. And he says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. And then he proceeds into this beautifully simple argument from nature, this argument about birds and flowers. And when I get to this text, I, I often think about what it might sound like today. That if all of us got together and we drove down to Lawton and we hiked a little ways up the Wichita's and Jesus preached for us the 2016 Sermon on the Mount, how might it sound? Because it's one thing to come to a text and ask, how can we read this text? But it's another thing to come to a text and ask, how does this text read us? And so here, here's what I think it might possibly sound like. Look at the birds of the air. They neither have master's degrees, nor insurance policies, nor 401ks, and yet your heavenly Father provides for them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about status? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, they neither check Snapchat nor obsess over likes. Yet I tell you, even Ariana Grande in all her glory is not esteemed like one of these. 
Jesus says, look, look, the birds aren't waking up trying to figure out how they can contribute to an economy. And flowers aren't waking up trying to figure out how they can be beautiful and adored. God provides for them. God makes them beautiful. God provides. And, and so Jesus is using this, this is actually kind of a common rabbinical argument that it, it's called from the minor to the major. Jesus is saying God cares for these minor things. So won't he much more care for his major things, for humanity, for you that bear his image? Therefore, do not worry about your life. And yet some of us, some of the more critical and skeptical among us might want to quibble here a little bit with Jesus. We might want to actually say, well, well, wait a minute, Jesus, aren't aren't you actually being a little bit ignorant? I mean, not all birds are fed. You know, people starve, birds starve, not everyone is always provided for. And, And you know, Jesus, there's actually so much in this world to be worried about. I I mean you know, maybe, maybe we should just give Jesus a pass, you know, because he didn't have an iPhone or a Wi-Fi connection or Wikipedia. Maybe he just wasn't aware of what was going on. But when we read further in the Gospel of Matthew, we see that's clearly not the case. Jesus clearly didn't have any illusions about an easy world. In Matthew chapter 10, when he's preparing his disciples to be sent out to to evangelize and heal, he says, They will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. Jesus is the opposite of ignorance. Jesus is intimately acquainted with the fragility of life. He knew suffering and he knew it well and and he warned his disciples about it. And so scattered throughout this passage of Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says three times, do not fear, do not fear, do not worry. So it's not, not despite these cares of the world, it's not because of these cares of the world that Jesus says not to worry. It's, it, it is because of them. And so Jesus, between each acknowledgement, repeats this refrain of peace. Because he's not trying to argue that the world is this, you know, this empirically verifiable utopia. Remember, this is kind of a rabbinic rhetorical argument. And so I think in Matthew chapter 6 here, Jesus His words are a poetic confession of complete reliance upon God. Let me say that again. They are a poetic confession of complete reliance upon God. Birds and flowers stand as rich symbols for the much larger truth of God's love and care for creation. Jesus' words become a grammar of hope. For his followers, they become a a cold drink in a dry land of thirsty souls. And so in the midst of the hardships of the world, Jesus is teaching his followers not, not a posture of anxiety, but a posture of faith. And believe it or not, I actually find an interesting parallel to this in the martial art of judo. You see, in judo, which is a martial art that you try to pin your opponent, you know, based on different takedowns and throws and holds, and and any judo instructor will tell you that one of the, the biggest fears and issues for a novice is overcoming the fear of being thrown. But being thrown and throwing your opponent is, is an important part of judo, so this is an important issue to overcome. But the problem is, is that as you fear being thrown more, it, it affects your posture and, and your judo form in negative ways. And not only that, but you will tense up, you will be in this kind of anxious posture that will actually make the falls, the throws, the impact of them hurt even more. On the other hand, 
if you learn to relax, if you learn to, to fear the throwing less, the impact of the blow, you'll be looser and it will spread out more. You will be less hurt as you are thrown. So it's kind of this vicious circle. And so I think we face a similar problem with worry and anxiety in our own lives. Because the more we search for security in the world and and in ourselves, the more we fear trials and suffering, the more we kind of tense up and, and stiffen into this posture of anxious defense. And not only does that sometimes cause unnecessary, even unfounded pain for us, but it it makes the net effect of suffering much worse in the end. And thus Jesus says, can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? You see, Jesus wants to transform our stiff, anxious posture of worry into a relaxed posture of faith. And so he does that by talking about God's provision for his creation. He points us to the grace of creation, the grace of the world. And actually, in in one of my all-time favorite poems by Wendell Berry, I actually think he captures this sentiment so beautifully. It's a poem called The Peace of Wild Things, and I just want to read it for you this morning. When despair for the world grows in me, And I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water. And the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water. And I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Wendell Berry is a Christian farmer and essayist and poet, and it would shock me greatly if he was not very consciously channeling Jesus' words in our very text this morning. But it speaks brilliantly not only of the way that God sustains his creation, but of the way that that sustenance in turn gives us peace. Jesus highlights this grace of the world, this grace of creation, to remind us ultimately of a larger reality, church, which is the kingdom. In fact, our entire passage this morning turns on this very idea, this this particular phrase towards the end of this section, Jesus says, therefore do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear, for it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. What relieves our anxiety is the kingdom of God. What gives us a posture of faith is the assurance of God's provision, is presence in the kingdom. And and so this morning, before we close, I I just quickly want to go through three different ways that we see the kingdom relieving our anxiety. And the first way the kingdom relieves our anxiety is the king's communication. In that section we just read, um, Jesus instructs his disciples not to strive after material possessions as the Gentiles do. And then he, he says this phrase, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. And that should sound familiar to those in the crowd who have been listening to this sermon and to us if we've been reading the Sermon on the Mount because it harkens back to a very similar phrase just previously in chapter 6. Jesus says, when you are praying... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Church, let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. When we assume this posture of prayer, when we take part in the king's communication, we remember that the Father is listening. We remember that He knows our needs before we ever ask, and He is a good, good Father that gives good gifts. He provides our daily bread. He forgives our debts. He rescues us from the evil one. This is our prayer, church. This is how we begin seeking the kingdom. And this is the salve for our troubled, anxious souls. And the king's communication, this way of seeking the kingdom, only makes sense within the king's community. Notice that the prayer we just prayed is in the plural. It's it's our Father. It's give us this day our daily bread. And one of the most common mistakes that we make when we read the Sermon on the Mount is we tend to view it through an individual lens. We tend to think that that Jesus is just preaching to us and we need to to be these lone wolf, white-knuckling heroes that can live up to the kingdom standards. But, But that's just simply not the case. As one commentator says, the sermon is not a heroic ethic. It is the constitution of a people. You cannot live by the demands of the sermon on your own, but that is the point. The demands of the sermon are designed to make us depend on God and one another. So when we have no bread, there's bread in the hand of our brother. And when we have no comfort, there is a word of comfort from our sister. We, we are citizens of the king's community together where, where we don't let lamps go out, where we don't let wells run dry. We share in openness and grace and we listen to the needs of one another. And in turn, the anxiety of our sin, the worries of our existence are alleviated in the presence of Christ in his community. Church, we strive for the kingdom and we always strive together. Which brings us finally to the greatest way that the kingdom relieves our anxiety. And that's through the the king's cross. Every haunting worry, every stinging fear, every abysmal experience reaches its climax in the abyss of Christ's cross. Jesus endured the forsakenness of God for us. And the shadow of the cross was all over his life and ministry. Even as he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount, Golgotha is in the background. But on the cross, he took the weight of the world's worry. Every fear, every concern, and he endured the forsakenness of the Father for our sake. As one theologian puts it, in the vicarious anguish of his passion, Christ redeemed subdued and gave meaning to all human fear you know i love the book of first john and particularly chapters three and four because in chapter three john writes that we know love by this that he laid down his life for us and then he follows it up later in the very next chapter by saying perfect love casts out fear That's been a source of great comfort to me in my life. And I hope it's a source of great comfort to you, church. I hope that you will leave your cares at the King's cross, that you will nail your anxiety to that cursed tree and remember that that Jesus rose in victorious power to conquer death's sting. Let's stand and praise him for his great love this morning.
Why should I worry? Why do I freak out? benediction this morning i just simply want to leave you with the words of first peter 5 7 church that you would cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you go in peace this morning Yeah, you are, yeah, you are.